The piece that I want to talk about is on screen. It's called A Monument to the Minds of the Little Steel Workers. Like Joanne and Alpha and Greg, I'm here to testify not only to Thornton Dial's greatness, but also to the fact that he didn't come out of nowhere. He didn't come from nothing. Nothing comes from nothing, which is what Mr. Dial speaks again and again, as in this highly wrought, well wrought, overwrought iron, folded or filled with air and flowers, like the skeleton of a Charles Babbage fantasy, the difference engine that Mr. Dial built and designed in a kind of critical transcendence of private property and of monocultural violence. And what I want to do today, beginning with a couple of epigraphs, um, the length of which I apologize for, is to think about Mr. Dial's work in terms of this notion of a critique of, of private property and a critique of monoculture. So the two uh, passages that I want to quote are from, uh, the first one is from Karl Marx's Grundrisse, in which he writes, what is wealth other than the universality of individual needs, capacities, pleasures, productive forces, etc., created through universal exchange? The full development of human mastery over the forces of nature, those of so-called nature as well as of humanity's own nature, the absolute working out of his creative potentialities with no presupposition other than the previous historic development, which makes this totality of development, i.e. the development of all human powers as such, the end in itself, not as measured on a predetermined yardstick, where he does not reproduce himself in one specificity, but produces his totality, strives not to remain something he has become, but is in the absolute movement of becoming. And the second quote is from Michael Hart and Antonio Negri's book, Commonwealth. The poor, in other words, refers not to those who have nothing, but to the wide multiplicity of all those who are inserted in the mechanisms of social production, regardless of social order or property. Multitude, defined in this way, comes to connote the lowest rank of society and the propertyless, since they are the most visibly excluded from the dominant political bodies. But really, it is an open, inclusive social body, characterized by its boundlessness and its originary state of mixture among social ranks and groups. I want to think about Thornton Dial within a specifically black Marxist frame and problematic but also within the context of a certain radical aesthetic, of certain radical aesthetic and social interventions made over the last 40 years in Italy that fall under the rubrics of arte povera and autonomous thought, both of which, insofar as they also make something new and something else out of Marx's own innovations, can be situated in relation to the question of a non-oppositional relation between wealth and poverty. Insofar as he wields the hammer that Marx and Lenin were thinking about when they said hammer and sickle, or more recently that Robin Kelly was thinking about when he talked about hammer and hoe. Thornton Dial moves also in these orbits of social theory and socio-poetics, and this is not accidental or a function of individual genius, however much Mr. Dial emphatically asserts and makes visible everything anyone ever thought they meant by appealing to that notion. I also want to think about Mr. Dial as a black worker in the Deep South, along lines introduced by Jose Hudson, the great black Marxist labor organizer and strategist who spent time in and around the foundries of Birmingham, Alabama, and its environs. And in a different register, Deborah McDowell, the brilliant black literary critic whose memoir, Leaving Pipe Shop, thinks and illuminates the ordinary heroism that serially appeared in and as the working class black social life of the neighborhood in Bessemer, Alabama, that she and Mr. Dial each provisionally called home and will have never been said to have completely left or left behind. 
Consider the, la the way labor unrest and worker insurgency, mutual indebtedness and supposedly impossible common sociality animated pipe shop. These elements were a big part of the noise, the background radiation out of which everything emerged as a kind of light or material breath. I want to talk about the autonomous aesthetic thrust of black radicalism as something liberation theologians call a preferential option for the poor. But this demands that we ask after Hart and Negri's formulation, if it is not that the poor have nothing, then what do they have? And how does this having operate in relation to poverty? It requires some consideration of a social economy of dispossession, a social circulation of wealth that is manifest in indebtedness. The poor are the ones without credit, but they are indebted to one another. They make a preferential option for one another in an infinite series or incalculable web of small acts of claiming and reclamation, conviviality and commensality that constitute the renewal of their own sociality and the resistance to whatever attempt to suppress the sociality of the ones who just get up and go to work every day. These were the folks that my grandfather, much like Mr. Dial, called smart. I used to think that smart in this usage was simply the opposite of lazy, but I have come to understand that what he meant was that the people who get up and go to work every day get up and go to school every day. Here's where the question of poverty and the question of things is all bound up with the question of study. Consider pipe shop not only as enclosure and zone of relegation, but also as refuge and university. Its inhabitants are the keenest dialecticians, as Brecht would say. They study change. They are preoccupied with generativity and its irreducible relation to decay. But what, belong, but what belongs to the poor, to the refugees, to the ones who study change. Samuel R. Delaney says that in order to have a transition, you need to be armed. What is the armature, the arsenal of the poor, the ones who, in having nothing, have everything? This question is inseparable from other fundamental questions. Why is there something rather than nothing? Why are there some things rather than no things? What is the relationship between something and nothing that animates our understanding of poverty, of the vernacular, of the common, of their insurgent force, of their generative but incalculable wealth? Consider that we live within the history of a double violation, the denigration of things and the coincident devaluation of people that is carried out by what is supposed to be their reduction to things. We have to linger. Art allows us to linger between something and nothing, nothing and everything, so that we can begin to understand again how the interrelation of wealth and poverty is all bound up with the question, which is to say the study of things. I would love, by way of this trajectory, to make a monument to Mr. Dial's mind. In a recent review of Frederick Jameson's book, Valences of the Dialectic, Benjamin Kunkel writes that it's tempting to propose a period stretching from about 1983 when Thatcher having, when Margaret Thatcher having won a war and Ronald Reagan having survived a recession consolidated their popularity to 2008 when the neoliberal program launched by Reagan and Thatcher was set back by the worst economic crisis since the depression. During this period of neoliberal ascendancy which is also, I think, roughly equivalent to the, or roughly coterminous with the period of, of, of Mr. Dow's sort of public life as, a, as an artist. An era of deregulation, financialization, industrial decline, demoralization of the working class, the collapse of communism, and so on. It often seemed easier to spot the contradictions of Marxism than the more famous contradictions of capitalism. The year that marks the beginning of the period Kunkel proposes, which is characterized by what he calls the peculiar condition of an economic theory that had turned out to flourish above all as a mode of cultural analysis, a mass movement that had become the province of an academic elite, and an intellectual tradition that had arrived at some sort of culmination right at the point of apparent extinction, is also the year of the publication of Cedric Robinson's great book, Black Marxism, the making of the black radical tradition, 
a book that could be said to have announced the impasse Kunkel describes precisely in its fugitive refusal of it. If the culmination of the Marxian intellectual tradition coincides with the moment in which Jameson begins magisterially to gather and direct all of its resources towards a description and theorization of what most clear-eyed folks agree is a deflated, defeated spirit of the present age, Robinson's project has been to alert us to the radical resources that lie before that tradition, where before indicates both what precedes and what awaits, animating our times with fierce urgency. One of the fundamental contradictions of capitalism is that it establishes conditions for its own critique, which anticipates a collapse whose increasing imminence increasingly seems to take the form of endless deferral that those very conditions seem to render that critique incomplete insofar as it will have always failed to consider capitalism's racial determination is in turn a contradiction fundamental to Marxism. While black Marxism emphatically exposes these contradictions, it is not reducible to such exposure. Rather, in elucidating an already given investigation of the specificities of Marxism's founding, anti-foundational embarrassment, which bears the massive internal threat of critique becoming an end in itself while operating in the service of the renovation rather than the overturning of already existing social and intellectual structures. Robinson understands the Marxian tradition as part of the ongoing history of racial capitalism. This is not dismissal. Indeed, it echoes the deepest and richest sounds of Marx's own blackness. It does, however, sanction the question in which I'm interested today, or one of the questions, by way of Mr. Dial. What made Robinson's critique, and more importantly, that which in Robinson's work and in Marx's exceeds critique, possible? The answer, or at least the possibility for a more precise rendering of the question, is also to be found in black Marxism, where critique is interrupted by its own eruptive condition of possibility, roughly at the book's rich, dense, but simultaneously open and capacious center, a chapter called The Nature of the Black Radical Tradition, which in my own twisted up head actually has its visual analog in this piece. Robinson's critical discovery of racial capitalism depends upon and extends the preservation of what he calls the ontological totality. In describing this integrated totality's character, Robinson notes how preservation impossibly proceeds within the confines of a metaphysical system that had never allowed for property in either the physical, philosophical, temporal, legal, social, or psychic senses. Its motive force is the renunciation of actual being for historical being, out of which emerges a revolutionary consciousness that is structured by, but underived from, the social formations of capitalist slavery, or the relations of production of colonialism. It is not just that absolutist formulations of a kind of being fabricated are here understood themselves to be fabrications. It is also that renunciation will have ultimately only become intelligible as a general disposition, disruption of ownership and of the proper when the ontological totality that black people claim and preserve is understood to be given only in this more general giving. The emergence and preservation of blackness as the ontological totality, the revolutionary consciousness that black people hold and pass, is possible only by way of the renunciation of actual being and the ongoing conferral of historical being, the gift of historicity as claimed, performed dispossession. Blackness, which is to say black radicalism, is not the property of black people. All that we have and are is what we hold in our outstretched hands. This open collective being is blackness, racial difference mobilized against the racist determination it calls into existence in every moment of the ongoing endangerment of actual being, of subjects who are supposed to know and own. It makes a claim upon us even as it is that upon which we all can make a claim precisely because it and its origins are not originary. That claim, which is not just one among others, because it is also just one plus more among others, however much it is made under the most extreme modes of duress, in an enabling exhaustion that is, in Stanley Cavell's word, unowned, takes the form, in Edouard Glissant's word, of consent. 
to consent not to be a single being, which is the an original and originary constitution of blackness as radical force, as historical paraontological totality, is for Robinson the existential and logical necessity that turns the history of racial capitalism, which is also to say the Marxist tradition, inside out. What cannot be understood within or as a function of the deprivation that is the context of its genesis can only be understood as the ongoing present of a common refusal. This old new kind of transcendental aesthetic, off and out in its eminence as a scientific productivity such eminence projects, is the unowned, differential, differentiated thing itself that we hold out to one another in the bottom, under our skin, for the general can at the rendezvous of victory. To say that we have something only insofar as we relinquish it is to say that we come from somewhere only insofar as we leave that place behind. Genesis is dispersion. Somewhere is everywhere and nowhere as the radical dislocation we enact where we stay and keep on going before the beginning, before every beginning and all belonging in under common variance, in arrivance and propulsion, in the flexed load of an evangelical bridge passed on this surreptitious, surreptitious vamp here. If you need some, come on, get some. We come from nothing, which is something misunderstood. It's not that blackness is not statelessness. It's just that statelessness is an open set of social lives whose animaterialized exhaustion remains an irreducible chance. Statelessness is our terribly beautiful open secret, the unnatural habitat and habitus of analytic engines with synthetic capacities. Preservation is conditional branching, undone computation, tuned, forked, tongued, improvisation in what it forges, digital speculation beyond the analogical or, or representational or calculative reserve. Critique, for example, the deciphering of the fundamental discursive structures that deform Western civilization is part of its repertoire, but it must always be kept in mind that cryptanalytic assertion has a cryptographic condition of possibility. This particular interplay of critique and preservation, analysis and hermeticism is black art. It is also black studies, and Mr. Dial is a major contributor to both. He allows us to ask, and it is to him that the question ought to be directed. Where can creative intellectual work be done in the midst of the vocational enclosure of the university, in the commercial enclosure of the art world, in the ideological enclosure that one might call, even though both of its terms need radically to be called into question, the intellectual's public? The ascription of self-taught or outsider are expressions of desire and anxiety that redouble the structures of deprivation and privilege to which they, in, they react. The long self-imposition of austerity, which conceptualism and minimalism and pop reflect and to which they respond, sometimes beautifully, as if by accident, in that narrow slice of the intellectual and artistic milieu that delusionally thinks of itself as central is the perennial inhabitation of a crisis. Sometimes it seems like we are trapped in the correspondence of this assumed legitimacy of exclusion and austerity, in which enclosure is exercised as a kind of right, and disposability is understood to be an essential quality of every earthly inhabitant. This is why we are so fortunate that Thornton Dial extends a sociopoetic tradition of studying the eloquence of things, that he is able to see that eloquence as depth, texture and syntax and visually amplify the macrophonic assemblage that we call the world, illuminates a certain problematic of lessons in which how and where he pursues this deep, rigorous, advanced learning is all bound up with what he passes on to those who are willing to attend. The capacity to discover and invent things, which is to say things of beauty, is not only something with, with which Mr. Dial is richly endowed, but is also one of his fundamental and enduring themes. He is concerned with material and sensual emergences of light, flashes of eye, spirit, glints, echoes, small cutting acts of speech that cut speech in the interest of its formation and their subsequent fades and traces. 
Mr. Dial's studies of the interplay of the informal and form are evidence of his rigorous training in both. I'm almost at the end. I have one more quote. This is from John Dunn's Devotions Upon Emergent Occasions. This is nature's nest of boxes. The heavens contain the earth, the earth cities, cities men, and all these are concentric. The common center to them all is decay, ruin. Only that is eccentric which was never made. Only that place or garment rather which we can imagine but not demonstrate. That light which is the very emanation of the light of God in which the saints shall dwell, with which the saints shall be apparelled. Only that bends not to this center, to ruin. That which was not made of nothing is not threatened with this annihilation. All other things are, even angels, even our souls. They move upon the same poles, they bend to the same center, and if they were not made immortal by preservation, their nature could not keep them from sinking to this center, annihilation. Mr. Dial's work bespeaks a whole other ecology of things of their abundance in the refusal of whatever notion of the disposable. This is another essential theme of and in his work. One might speak of the biodiversity of that work, of a kind of uncut imaginative generativity that studies generativity. One is tempted to refer to, but one must beware the ex nihilo, as Dunn understands it. Because Mr. Dial serially lets us know that there's no such thing as nothing, as the out of nothing, as making something out of nothing, of making a way out of no way. Mr. Dial makes things out of things. They are things, there are ways, and he is educated in their eloquence. Mr. Dial allows and requires us to think the impermanence, the extraordinary evanescence and ephemerality of the non-disposable, of that which was not made of nothing, a divinity that now must be understood as common that his works may someday disappear or fall apart, not into nothing, but rather into the informal, deformed, informing some things that they were, which is to say into the general condition of possibility that we call the life cycle, the recycle, exists for me as a massive incalculable source of comfort. In these works, the richness of the informal is given to, but not suppressed by form. Someday someone will make something out of the fragments of something Mr. Dial made. What will be made then, what will be made again, what will be remade again and again is where and when something will emerge as the anarchic principle of creativity. What I've been trying to say is that in order to begin to consider the question of where Mr. Dial is coming from, you have to be able to assume that he comes from somewhere. And to consider that where he comes from is not only a place to be studied, a place that has been studied, but that it is a place of study, a place where people are engaged in study, immersed in the articulation of a poetics of study. Pipe shop, as McDowell luminously remembers it, Professor McDowell, I should say, luminously remembers it, is an institute for advanced study. In Mr. Dial's serial reconstruction of it, we come to know Pipe Shop as something both left and born, deconstructed and reborn. To say that Mr. Dial makes things is also to say that he makes studies. Mr. Dial studies intensely, massively, passionately. He studies, his works are studies of and in an alternative ecology that challenges the traditional conception of the work. They are life studies of and in the life cycle that move against the grain of Marx's own fantasies of human mastery over nature. Independent of the question of whether they will or can be preserved is the question of what they preserve, precisely in the relatively immediate question of their decomposition and in their incorporation of the fact and question of decomposition. They preserve by way of their eruptive recombinant force, the ontological totality. <clears throat> 